Is obesity a choice? This is a tough question, and a lot of people seem to think about it something like this, where you have an obese button on the left and a not obese button on the right. And anyone who is currently obese is obese because they made a conscious decision to press the obese button. But I don't think that's how it works. I mean, for starters, if you selected 100 people at random and gave them the option, my guess is that almost every one of them would press the not obese button. People know about the potential health risks and social stigma that can come with being obese, so virtually no one would consciously choose to be obese in this simplistic sense. But maybe it looks something more like this, where you have this lifelong continuous series of choices to pick certain foods over others, like whether to order fried chicken or grilled chicken, regular Coke or Diet Coke, a small fries or a supersized fries and certain behaviors over others, like whether to get up and exercise or stay on the couch. And over time, maybe it's the cumulative effect of these many individual choices that causes someone to become obese. I do think this is a bit closer to reality. However, even this analogy is still very incomplete. Consider this graph taken from a 1990 study where 24 subjects were overfed by 1,000 calories per day for 100 days, or just over three months. All the subjects were under 24-7 supervision by the research staff, so we can be confident they were actually following the protocol. Each one of these bars represents a single person, and the height of the bar represents how much weight they gained in response to the same 1,000 calorie surplus. This person, over here on the left, only gained an extra 10 pounds, while this person, over here on the right, gained an extra 30 pounds while eating the same 1,000 calories extra per day. This could be due to a number of factors, but a big one is genetic differences in metabolism. Looking at this later study from 2018, we can see that just like there are large differences in weight gain, there are also large differences in how many calories people burn at rest. Just sitting on the couch, doing nothing at all, this lucky person over here burns about 150 calories more than metabolic equations predict, and this person on the left would burn 250 calories less than metabolic equations predict. In other words, if none of these people exercised at all, this person would still burn about 400 calories more per day than this person. So going back to the buttons, a small fries from McDonald's has about 200 calories and a supersized fries has about 600 calories. All else being equal, that's a 400 calorie surplus if you choose to supersize. But this person also burns 400 calories more. So through no action of their own, they could choose to supersize every time and their net caloric balance would be exactly the same as this other person who chooses the small fries. But this only considers resting energy expenditure the number of calories you burn at rest. People also burn calories through exercise, the thermic effect of food, and something called non-exercise activity thermogenesis, or NEAT. And the NEAT component of metabolism can vary dramatically between individuals, even more than resting energy expenditure. NEAT refers to the calories you burn from daily activities that aren't actual exercise. So stuff like fidgeting, tapping your feet, etc. And even though you can somewhat modify your NEAT levels by making an extra effort to move around a bit more throughout the day, NEAT is still largely subconsciously regulated in the brain and it's dynamic. So if you have a genetic predisposition for low NEAT, you aren't very hyperactive and you don't fidget much, and let's say you tried to force yourself to fidget more, in many cases, your brain would simply find a way to lower NEAT someplace else. So NEAT is, to a significant degree, outside of your control and it can differ enormously between individuals. This study from Levine and colleagues overfed participants by 1,000 calories per day for eight weeks and found that NEAT levels ranged from negative 98, they actually moved around less, to plus 692 calories per day. This means that while both of these subjects ate an extra 1,000 calories per day, this person quite literally fidgeted off about 700 of those extra 1,000, while this person actually fidgeted less meaning their body had to deal with all those extra 1,000 calories eaten, plus a little more. So clearly, anyone who's been genetically blessed with a high resting metabolic rate and high NEAT levels can choose to press the junk food button many more times and still maintain a lower body weight compared to someone who's not as metabolically gifted. And this matches with our everyday experience. We all know someone who can eat whatever they want and remain almost inexplicably thin, and we all know someone who's tried every diet book on the shelf yet remains overweight. Now, most people would be quick to praise the thin person for their discipline and critique the overweight person for simply lacking willpower and making the wrong choices, not realizing the many baseline genetic factors that could be making it very easy for the thin person to stay thin and making it very hard for the overweight person to lose any weight at all. But that's just metabolism. There's another big factor here, which is hunger. Research also shows that some people simply experience more hunger than others in response to dieting. 
Some people feel like they're constantly fighting their body's urge to eat more, while others feel more normal hunger where it's low after meals and picks up as it gets closer to mealtime. Just consider this hunger study from 2013, which looked at the difference between eating a high fat meal and a low fat meal. Now it turns out both the high fat meal and the low fat meal were able to suppress hunger very well on average. However, when that average trend was split up into individual subjects, you suddenly see this huge disparity between individuals. Some people were still quite hungry after eating the meal, others felt very full. And since hunger is what naturally drives food intake for most people, we once again see that someone who still feels very hungry after a meal will have a harder time stopping compared to someone who feels full. So we've covered two genetic factors explaining why weight gain happens to some people more easily than others, even given the same food and exercise choices. But there are still so many other biological factors that can play a role, such as whether or not you take certain medications that can increase appetite and water retention. There are also neuroendocrine conditions that can impact weight gain through hormones and metabolism. Then there's pregnancy and menopause, which have hormonal and metabolic impacts, and physical disabilities, which makes burning calories through NEAT and exercise more challenging. Now, of course, all of this doesn't mean that calories in, calories out only works for some people. It is a simple fact that obesity results from eating more calories than you burn. And tightly controlled metabolic ward experiments repeatedly confirm that caloric intake is the driver of both fat loss and fat gain. So this means that anyone who is obese got obese by eating in a sustained caloric surplus over time. It's just that avoiding that sustained surplus is so much harder for some people than it is for others and for reasons that are beyond their choosing. And this is why I think it's incorrect to reduce all of these factors down to a simple choice to be obese or not. Because if that were the case, why would obesity rates suddenly start trending up in the 1970s? Did people just suddenly start choosing to be obese? Or is there yet another layer to this? Well, no, I don't think that the spike was due to more people choosing to be obese, but rather from the fact that high calorie foods became so much more readily available for cheaper prices, meaning more people had more access to delicious, highly processed, high calorie foods. And this leads us into the whole other side of this, which is the environmental factors. So entirely apart from the genetic and biological factors that we just went through, there are also environmental factors that can impact your susceptibility to obesity. This includes stuff like the food environment, where apart from the spike in availability, we also see better, flashier marketing for high calorie foods that promote overconsumption and large portion sizes. There's also the fact that junk food tends to be cheaper, meaning it's more accessible for people of lower economic incomes. Then there are social factors, like the type of diet your family and friends eat, which can make it a lot harder, or in the case of dependents like children, virtually impossible to make so-called good choices. Then there are the lifestyle factors, like how much sleep you get. And while it may be tempting to tell people to just get more sleep, that isn't always feasible depending on work and other responsibilities. In fact, this 2017 meta-analysis found that night shift work was associated with a 23% higher risk of being overweight, and this 2019 meta-analysis found a dose-response relationship between sleep duration and obesity risk. Less sleep meant more risk of being obese, with seven to eight hours being the sweet spot on average. Then there are psychological factors like stress and depression. This 2010 meta-analysis of 14 studies found that stress was a risk factor for weight gain, and this other meta-analysis from the same year found that depression was predictive of obesity risk. So coming back to the original question, is obesity a choice? Well, I think the answer is no, at least not in all cases, and certainly not in the simplistic sense. There's just too much of an influence from genetics and environment to shift the blame entirely on the individual for their circumstance. But that also doesn't mean that no one has any control over their health and their body weight. Clearly, if people wanna lose weight, even if there are many factors working against them, such as low metabolic rate, high hunger, and so forth, it's still possible to lose weight if you sustain a caloric deficit over time. And I can link another video here explaining exactly how to do that, which goes beyond simply eating less calories and delves into behavioral modifications that most people will need to make to have long-term success. Ultimately though, I think the is obesity a choice question comes back to semantics. Perhaps what I mean by choice is slightly different from what you mean by choice, but I think that if you did wanna argue that it is a choice in some sense, I think the best you could do is say that it's a complex series of choices intertwined with many other complex contributing factors. And so as people in the health and fitness space, I think we should make an effort to be more understanding of these factors and more compassionate toward people who are struggling rather than making assumptions about their choices and their characteristics. And then instead of blaming them for their circumstance, instead focus on pointing them in the right direction with good sustainable nutrition advice when they ask for it. 
Now, I wanna give a quick shout out to Dr. Mike Isretel for the button analogy. I first heard that from him and I thought it was great. And I'll also go ahead and link all the articles that I referenced in this video down below. And before we go, I wanna thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning community that has thousands of classes for people looking to step up their creative game, whether that be learning about video editing or photography, marketing, business, and everything in between. Over the years, I've used Skillshare to help me learn more about video production and video editing to the point that I'm able to do any step in my own content creation process entirely on my own. And even though I do think that outsourcing can be helpful for certain things, I think that if you are in a creative line of work or if you wanna be in one, I think being able to do these skills on your own gives you so much more power and control over your content. And Skillshare is amazing because in addition to giving you access to thousands of classes taught by fellow creatives, it also gives you access to a learning community of people who are also developing the same skills as you. One of the things that's always been really important to me as someone who runs an online business is letting people know what it is that I have to offer without coming across as salesy, gimmicky, or cheesy. And if that's a skill that you're also looking to develop, I strongly recommend this course taught by Jesse Forrest about how to write web copy that sells without being cheesy. And to help you guys get started, Skillshare is offering the first 1,000 of my viewers to sign up using my code or the link in the description, a free one month trial of Skillshare so that you can start exploring your creativity today. So make sure you're one of the first 1,000 people to get a head start on that skill that you're looking to master. All right, thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring the video. I really do appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to leave me a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys all here in the next one.